Well, I believe that there is a battle on, and the battle that I'm speaking of is not between Democrats and Republicans, although that has a lot of our energy during this week, of course. The battle that I speak of is an undeclared battle. It's not public. Most of the battle that I'm speaking of is private. It's in here. The battle has to do with our minds and our hearts, our psyche, our emotions. The battle has to do with our souls. This battle has to do with our loyalty and our love and our commitment and how you and I are going to spend our life. It's very personal. It's oftentimes insidious, this battle. We have a choice to make each and every day. And the choice that you and I make each and every day when I put our feet on the floor is to say, am I going to receive today God's gracious love that guides and governs and holds me up, that love that redeems and then also animates us in the Spirit? Am I going to choose that God of love and that guiding presence in my life, or am I going to go it alone? Make it up as I go, we might say. There's a whole lot of making up of lives these days when the God of love is holding out grace to each of us each and every day. When we lived in New York City a few years ago, we used to ride on the number six train a lot, and placards inside would announce and advertise, and one day I saw plastered across one of the walls, you can't go it alone in New York City. (laughs) And that's right. You and I cannot go alone in New York City or in Jacksonville or Atlanta or Topeka or Seattle or Hong Kong, you and I are not made to go it alone, to make it up as we go. So you and I have some choices to make each and every day, and the battle has to do with that choice. To better understand this battle, I want to invite us back a long time ago, 3,200 years ago, actually to a worship service that's not unlike this one. Although we're not present with each other like we normally would, we are together as the community of faith as they were at the Valley of Shechem. Now before we go to Shechem, let me rehearse that prior to Joshua chapter 24, a whole lot has already happened. And that is, uh, the Israelites were free to go into the Sinai Desert. We know that they wandered there for 40 years. Then they went into the Promised Land. They had the Battle of Jericho. They made some commitments to themselves as they took claim of this new place for their community. And then those 12 tribes then gathered at Shechem. The year is 1200 B.C. The leader is Joshua, of course, and he stands before them. I want you to imagine a large, expansive valley on which sits a big rock, and out in the valley and along the hillsides are the 12 tribes of Israel. Joshua gathers there at the first of what was going to become the tribal Amphictides. That is, every year they would gather, almost like we do at Christmas and Easter, Pentecost, to gather and celebrate their life in God. There Joshua, using, I can imagine, a robust voice, then says to the 12 tribes from that hillside, you have been worshiping some false gods. And you know it, actually. You've been serving those gods, the gods of our fathers beyond the river, he names, 
You have been worshiping the gods of the masters in Egypt. You've also been worshiping the gods of the Amorites. You've gone after them as if your life depended on them. Because as you're trying to make it up, he might have said, you've taken on some of these gods. Therefore, choose you this day, Joshua commends them, to choose the God of life, the God of our ancestors, the God who claims us, walks with us, the God who gives us gracious love each and every day. And there they recommitted themselves. So the battle is on. It's very private and personal. It happens in here. Well, I'm not Joshua. And you're not the people of Israel. But the same gods continue to infiltrate our hearts. Joshua names at least three of them. Joshua speaks first of the gods beyond the river. Well, who were they? What were those gods? They were gods that we might say were like golden calves. They were the gods of things, of possessions of possessiveness, of things that you and I can hold and own and find our identity by holding them. They're the gods of acquisitiveness. They're the gods who camp on the shores of all of our allurements. If we were to choose a name for these gods, you and I in our own world might call them materialism. That ism is what causes the insidiousness. It's the one that drives our alluring nature. If I had to put a symbol on it in my own uh, memory, it would be the symbol of an F. Let me explain. (laughs) When I was in college, one of my roommates was Malcolm. Malcolm was a pre-med major. He's now a physician, retired. Uh, Malcolm uh, loved automobiles. And during our college career, he said in those days, I would like to own a Ferrari one day. (laughs) He craved those kinds of cars. You know, the Apostle Paul says that money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And the word that the Apostle Paul uses is craving. When you crave money, or in Malcolm's case, when you crave automobiles, then you cave in to the God of beyond the river. Malcolm loved automobiles, and when he became a physician, he bought that Ferrari. It's the kind with the side doors that come up electronically. You know, you press a button, and they make a funny airplane sound, and they come up from the side, right? He loved that idea. The day he bought it, it was red, glistening, perfect shape. He drove that all around town, then drove it into his driveway. What he didn't expect was that the electrical system would die on him. When he was in his driveway, one of his neighbors who happened to be going to the grocery store saw him drive in, wondered about the new automobile, and found Malcolm in the driver's seat. When she was coming back from the grocery store, Malcolm was still in the driver's seat, held prison by an electrical system that wouldn't work. Of course, that becomes a parable of our worship of the God beyond the river, the God of possessiveness, of acquisitiveness, of craving things so much that we find our identity in them. That wasn't the only God that Joshua talked about that day at Shechem. He also talked about the God of their masters in Egypt. Those gods of Egypt were fertility gods, mystery religions, temple prostitutes. We might call them in our own day the gods of pleasure. If we had to put a name on this God in our own vernacular, it would be hedonism, 
the God that tells me that I am in the middle of my universe and I get to do whatever feels right. Whatever my feelings tell me, that's the direction I'm going to go. There's a lot of that going on in our society, by the way, as we're making it up as we go. There's a lot of people who take on this God. I'm going to go in the direction of my, the whim of my feelings. I'm going to do and buy and go and spend in such a way that it's just really good for me, that I'm in the middle of the universe. If this had a symbol, you and I might have a mural of the lifestyles of the rich and famous. They would be the gods that seduce us, that have pictures of foxy ladies and well-fed babies. The kinds of things that you and I know that when the economy turns south or when the relationship breaks apart or when our own life's dreams are cast on the rocks, this God does not hold us up, does not scale the cliff with us, does not plumb the depths with us. The God of the Amorites, which also was named by Joshua, isn't the God of possessiveness or the God of hedonism or the God of things or the God of pleasure. The God of the Amorites has to do with particularity and exclusiveness. The God of the Amorites would tell us, love only those people who look like you and who vote like you and who live in your neighborhood and go to your church and are part of your religion, who dress like you, who play the kind of sports that you and I play or go to the museums that you and I attend. They're our people, we might say. The Amorites had a God that said, you need to be just with your kind. If we put a name on this God, it would be called for members only. This God is prevalent in our culture right now. It's causing a lot of angst in our society, particularly in the United States as we have a presidential election. The Democrats are after the Republicans and vice versa. We have flags and yard signs that tell us These are my people. Those are not my people. And yet, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who meets us with gracious love each and every morning, tells us something different. Tells us that all of God's children are brothers and sisters, cousins, part of the same family and community. We declare it in our baptismal covenant. Will you respect the dignity of every human being? The God of the Amorites would say, heavens, no. We're not going to respect the dignity and the worth of all these people because they're not my people. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob comes along and says, oh, I've got good news for you. Yes, they are. (laughs) They're all my children. I'm calling you to discover that gracious love that's built into you for all of my children. The trouble with this battle, with these false gods, with these silly gods, actually, It's not that they're not powerful, to use a double negative. They are very powerful. They're very alluring. They cause us to cast our mind and heart and energy and money into them. The real trouble, of course, is that they're not up to their job. They're not up to scaling the walls with you or plumbing the depths with you. They're not used to things like sacrificial love and laying their life down on the line and going across their line of comfort. They're not used to being generous, gracious, and respectful, and mindful of the value of all of God's children. 
They cannot meet you and me in our worst days when we think all is lost, when anxiety has us gripped, when we wonder how we're going to live into the new day. So we have a choice each day to receive the gracious love of the God who comes along and meets us in the person of Jesus. instills in us a sense of ourself, a great worth in other people, gives us a great hope as we look off into the future. I bought my brand new 2021 calendar the other day. I'm so excited. I love calendars. I still write in them. I don't just do the electronic version. Uh, all of my colleagues around here and other places, they look at me like I'm just a troglodyte, and I am. I love a written, bound calendar. I have imitation black leather. I have a whole bunch of them, and I've got my new one. I began opening it up, began to realize that that really is a symbol of life for a lot of us. We have little boxes, and each day has a date, and each day has the things that you and I would choose for that day. The things of how we're going to spend our life, who our God's going to be, how we're going to exercise the gift of our life. And in that calendar, of course, we list all kinds of things. And I realized as I opened my new 2021 calendar that there will be a time when I walk into one of those boxes and that box does not lead to another box. There's no doorway from that box into the next box. It's going to be the last box this side of heaven. I begin to wonder how it is that you and I understand that place that imagination, that reality of you and I moving into the last box of the calendar. Could it be that because it doesn't have a doorway into the next box, therefore it does not have any boundaries? It doesn't have any side walls, in other words. It has no ceiling. It has no basement. It's wide open. Christians dare to say that the last box is open, wide, for us to realize the gracious love of the God who's been with us all along and who's now going to carry us into a larger life, we would say. We call that resurrection. And in that imagination, you and I can begin to say, then if that's the end game, if that's the choice I've made to be with the loving God, then that changes all the other boxes, doesn't it? the way we live, the way we spend our life, the way we exercise our energy, the way we spend our money. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in 1943 was in Tegel Prison. He was sure to face execution. He was terrorized by the Gestapo over and over. This is what he wrote as he looked into the, his own future. Christ takes hold of a person in the center of his or her life, not on the perimeter of existence where all the other gods of the world attach themselves but at the core of our being. If we can embrace, Bonhoeffer wrote, if we can embrace this reality, then the gods of this world have no power, have no influence as to how we'll exercise the love of God. And when we embrace the God of the core of our being, then our souls are saved. And when our souls are saved, 
then you and I make a decision that each and every day would be spent for the God of love and the world that God so loves. So Joshua gathered in a religious ceremony not unlike ours this morning, looking out at the 12 tribes of Israel as he would if he were here to give us a very important invitation. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. Amen.